Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and once again, a warm welcome to this, our fifth Community Wealth Building Open Learning event, focusing on local authorities and resources. Um, I'll be hosting today's session on behalf of EDAS, and it's great to see such a good attendance in the room. Today, our focus is on how local authorities are advancing community wealth building, and we'll be highlighting the importance of the role of councils, how community wealth building can fit into uh, council corporate strategy, and how progress is being made across the pillars of community wealth building across a range of pilot areas. To do this, we'll hear from councils who have been advancing community wealth building over the last few years in Fife, Glasgow, Clackmannanshire, and North Ayrshire. We were due to hear from Highlands and Islands Council too on the work they're taking forward linked to the procurement pillar, but unfortunately they've had to pull out of today's event. However, we will aim to roll their contribution into our final session of this current series, which are, we are finalising for June. As usual, um, we ask that you use the chat box to raise any interesting points, questions, observation and links to a community wealth building or any of the work that you're taking forward. Um, and we've scheduled time for questions throughout this afternoon with, um, well, really, as, as each, not as each of the speakers are, are uh, speaking, but um, at various punctuation points um, following their input. To begin with, we're going to hear from Tracy Jackson, Community Wealth Building Policy Manager with the Scottish Government, about the important role of local authorities in this theme and details of progress so far with Scottish Government's policy aspirations to expand and embed community wealth building across the country. Tracy is stepping in uh, for Neil McEnroy this afternoon, and we're very grateful for that. Neil's um, had to, um, he's undertaking another piece of work, um, but we're delighted to have you here, Tracy, and we know that you work closely with Neil um, within the Scottish Government. So um, without further ado, um, uh, I think we'll get started. We may finish a little bit early today just because we've had to um, truncate our, our programme slightly um, because of the, um, because of we're not hearing from Highlands and Islands, but we'll see how things go. Um, as ever, these things are always quite organic. So, um, OK, so Tracy, welcome and uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Liz. Thanks for that introduction. Can I just check with you? Can everybody see my slides? Yes, Tracy, just if you can go into presentation mode, that would be great. Well, do. It. Thank you. Just wanted to check you all had it. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. So as Liz said, I'm Tracy Jackson. I'm one of the policy managers for the Community Wealth Building team here at Scottish Government. We've also recently been joined by Julian McLaughlin, who I'm sure some of you will know um, from her work in both the Clyde Mission and North Ayrshire Council area um, to lead on the Community Wealth Building legislation. Team also includes Stephen uh, White, who heads up our unit, and we have Laura uh, Bremner, Lorraine Wiley and David Fitzpatrick, who often join these sessions. So as Liz says, I'm covering for Neil, um, much to my disappointment, uh, given that these events are recorded, um, but much to my mother's glee, because she thinks that this now means that I am a TV star. Um, so just to get started, Community Wealth Building Model, as you all know, is a model that offers a mature economic development. Community Wealth Building is a means to practically deliver on our Scotland's wellbeing and inclusive growth aspirations, and it's about the system. So it's about working with what's already been done. So it's not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but it is about making those changes that make the, system, the current system work better. And our minister is often heard referring to this as rewiring, rewiring, sorry, the economic system to give greater benefit for local communities, people and businesses within there. It's not about new projects or pro programmes, but it's about bending existing spend. And from the other speakers today, you're going to hear exactly how they've managed to do that and bring it to life for you. So it's about that system change and it will help to address the inequalities that we've been trying to address for years since deindustrialisation and globalisation. So thinking about specifically the local authority areas, and I think one of the key things that's probably going to come out of the, the discussions you're having later today is the, is the central role that our local authorities have been taking in driving forward community wealth building. They've been absolutely pivotal and bringing together the anchor institutions to bring about this change that helps us to rewire our local economic systems for the benefits of individuals and businesses alike. We are seeing our local authorities take on a bit of a leading role. So basically they are leading by example, and you'll hear a little bit more about that in terms of some of the pillar work that I've drawn out later on in this presentation. 
This one here, I think you'll all probably recognise, given that I'm standing in for Neil. Neil often talks about the redistribution of wealth and how we've been focusing on that at the moment. But community wealth building, as we all know, is more about what we can do to pre-distribute wealth before it's actually created. So that is about, are you part of an employee-owned company? Are you getting good, fair wages for the job that you're doing? And how can we ensure that we get more of that through what we're doing across each of the five pillars? So that leads us neatly on to a bit of a recap in terms of the pillars. So we have the five pillars, finance, which is all about how we can ensure the flows of investments coming into Scotland and into our localities work best for the local people and communities and businesses. That we are under workforce, increasing work and developing the local labour markets for the benefit of individuals that will eventually support those the well-being of those individuals as well through better health outcomes and mental health outcomes, for instance, by being in employment. We're also looking at what we can do under spending, so maximising community benefits of spend. So as we said at the outset, it's not about new projects, but about how we use our existing investment for better results. Land and property, again, maximising the value that local communities receive from land and property assets, including those that are held by the public sector. And again, through some of the work that's going on in the pilot areas, you'll hear about how some of the local authorities and anchor institutions are actually looking at what they own, their assets, and how they can better use these to support the localities in which they're based. And the final pillar there is about inclusive ownership. So that is about how we can ensure that our more local and social enterprises generating community wealth, including employee owned firms and co-ops. And as I mentioned just prior to you all joining us, um, I met with Ted Howard this morning and he was very inspirational around what happened in Cleveland, Ohio and the cooperatives that were set up there and then the, the infancy, if you like, a community wealth building and how that brought about significant change in the, the localities within Cleveland. One of the key things, as we've talked about already, is the anchor institutions. So anchor institutions are our universities, our police service, housing providers, there are NHS, Scottish Enterprise, all of our local councils and ourselves as Scottish Government. So we are all employers, purchasers, purchasers of services and goods. We all have land and property and we have a, a wealth of spending power behind us, something in the region of 13 billion a year through public procurement. And what we're starting to see through anchor charters is the, the commitment between all of the local anchors to come together to share these community wealth building goals to help improve the collective well-being of everybody within that locality, which will in turn help regional economies and our national economy. <laughs> So what have we been doing up to now? Now, apologies for some of you, because you may well have heard some of this before, but Neil thought it was important that we recap it. So in terms of community wealth building, the Scottish Government approach has been basically around these key areas. So we're looking at policy. How can we influence all policies within Scottish Government and all of the touch points that community wealth building has to take that community wealth building approach to apply that lens to their decision making for the benefit of localities. We've also focused in on practice because as most of you who may well have heard Ted speak in the past or Neil, the Democracy Collaborative isn't just about the research, if you like, and the theory behind community wealth building, but also that practice and putting that into practice. And that's the same approach that we've taken here in terms of Scotland. So we have our five pilot areas. So Clack Managers, South Scotland, Western Isles, T Cities, Fife and Glasgow City Region. And obviously you're going to hear from a couple of them later after me. We're also supporting the Ayrshire region um, through the Ayrshire Growth Deal. But what's been really heartening for us to see is that a lot of our other local authority areas and a number of them are named there on the slide have actually been driving forward their own community wealth building approaches regardless of what else is going on. And we are committed now through our COVID recovery strategy to supporting all 32 local authorities to develop community wealth building action plans to support the recovery of the local areas following COVID. Neil likes to talk about movement building. And that is about how we can ensure that 
Other players, other economic actors and sectors are integrating community wealth building into their development and delivery approaches. And we're seeing a lot of that starting to happen. So, for instance, we've had the Scottish Land Commission um, launch their own community wealth building guide to support people and organisations that own land and property to take a community wealth building approach and greater emphasis on the community benefits that that land or property can actually bring about. And finally, we are thinking about the legislation and I'll give you a bit more of an update on that. But suffice to say, we, we are committed to bringing forward community wealth building legislation in this parliamentary term, both through the programme for government and the re recently published NSET. So looking at the pillars, um, and I'm hoping I'm not stealing some of Sinead's thunder here, but in terms of the workforce pillar, we are starting to see a deepening practical application of fair work locally, and we've pulled out Fife as an example of that. Within CLACs, they're actually focusing in on the gender pay gap, so how can they actually improve the lot for women in the locality in terms of fair work and that agenda in terms of looking at sector-specific work that they want to do? Most areas, if not all, are actually stimulating local employment through spend. So they're looking at what they can do with, through the procurement to encourage companies to take on local people and stimulate the, the demand for apprentices. And the other side of that is around when a new um, industry is coming into an area by aligning both employability and economic development, we're actually meeting the demand for workers by new companies as they grow. In terms of land and property, we're seeing the application of the land rights and responsibility statement to ensure that we're greener and more productive use of land. There's the development of high streets through greater consideration of the ownership. And again, we've pulled out a couple of areas in terms of Clack Manager and Fife. And obviously in Glasgow, some of you may have already heard um, in the past some presentations from the Glasgow City Region where they're talking about how they are working to advance uh, vacant and derelict sites and bring them back into more productive use. In terms of finance, we are seeing a deepening and recognition and visibility of community finance through things like the Five Credit Union. We're also seeing different new, new and innovative ways of using credit unions in terms of some of the emerging practice that's coming out of some of our other local, local areas that are advancing community wealth building of their own right. Um, and I'll, I'll mention Renfrewshire Council there in terms of the link up that they have with their local credit union. We're also seeing the diversification of local government pensions, moving away from fossil fuels and looking to see what they can do in terms of more local investment. And we've also seen this happen in terms of Edinburgh University and their move from fossil fuels to try and look at um, better local investment and local projects that will support more individuals. And we're also looking at community wealth building through the growth deals and also through the work that's going on, on under the Clyde mission. So applying that community wealth building lens to maximise the outcomes for local people and localities in terms of this infrastructure projects. Spending is something that we've talked about a lot in terms of community wealth building. And I think the, the cycle of procurement there and the work that we're doing to help procurement realise its full potential, if you like, in terms of community benefits is underway. So we have a deeper awareness and application of community benefits through the establishment of community uh, benefits wish lists, and there are a number of localities doing this. We're seeing growing sectors and creating innovation between the um, within sorry, supply chains, and we're seeing that in SOSI in terms of the RSL, but we're also seeing that in some other areas. And again, sorry, Sinead, if you're going to talk about this, but um, Fife has been doing some of this work, as has CLACS and Glasgow City Region. And we're seeing again through Glasgow City Region, probably most um, a deepening um, awareness of planning for and securing pipeline of contracts, which helps then to increase the level of apprenticeships available within the construction sector. But through that planning, what we're doing is we're joining everything together so that it makes that supply chain, if you like, um, much, much better in terms of possible uh, contracts for people, which gives them secure tenure in terms of their apprentices that they then take on. 
And then in terms of inclusive ownership, we have been seeing a deepening recognition of the alternative ownership as part of the business model. So we're seeing employee cooperatives coming forward. We're hearing about succession planning in the Western Isles, for instance, and how the transfer of local companies to a more employee owned basis is something that they're planning to do and investigate in terms of that whole succession planning. We're seeing an increased role of the third sector in employee owned and cooperative development, so TSI is getting involved, and an increased recognition of inclusive ownership as part of the public sector supply chain, um, procurement and commissioning, with active engagement in the local supply chains to support these businesses to be ready to take advantage of the opportunities that are coming their way in terms of procurement. And finally, to talk a little bit more about the commitment that we have here in Scottish Government to bring forward legislation. This is a, an invitation for you all to get involved. Um, we had our inaugural Community Wealth Building Steering Group meeting last week, which was very positive. We were all heartened by the energy and enthusiasm to take forward legislation that's enabling and helps to support us all to implement community wealth building in the most appropriate manner and best manner for our localities. We want to create the conditions to enable it to be fully implemented and maximise the benefits locally. So we're about to embark on an intense period of discussion with key, key partners and those currently implementing community wealth building to identify potential legislative proposals. And we plan to have a consultation later on in this, in this year. But this is a plea for you all to get involved. If you have ideas about what we should be looking at in terms of legislation, if you have identified a blocker or an impediment that you have not come up with a solution for, or you think, more importantly, that the solution required is actually a legislative change, then please, by all means, get in touch with the team. So thank you all for listening. And so that you can get in touch with the team, I have actually provided a number of email addresses there, but I know that some of you may well have some of the other email addresses for the other contacts I mentioned at the start of this presentation. So thank you very much for listening and I hope that's been of some use to you all. I'll hand back to you Liz, thanks. Thanks very much. That was that was great, Tracy. And I think a really worthwhile and and helpful resume, really, of of both you know of of, of the pillars and the elements of community wealth building, but also giving us a sense of what's happening, um, and really the kind of I suppose the pace that things are kind of picking up now around a whole range of areas, um, both geographic and and thematic. Um, so um, I I'm just looking to see if there's anything in the chat box that anyone would want to raise. But I think some of it's more kind of dis discursive at the moment. Um, so um, on that basis, um, and does anybody? I'm going to just ask: Does anybody ha um, have we got any raised hands? Does anybody have any questions they would want to raise with um, Tracy? Because Tracy is going to have to leave us shortly and can't stay for the remainder of the of the session. So just if anybody has any questions they would like to or comments they would like to raise with Tracy. I know Alison, I'm going to have to ask you to help yep. me because I can't always see. That's fine. Just for speak. Tracy, could you press the X beside share at your leave beside your leave button, just the X box and that'll get the, the screen back. There we go. Um, Do we have anybody wants to say anything? I can see a hand, but I can't see who the hand is. Alison, can you Morris. identify that? Yes, Roy Morrison. Roy, do you want to come in? Hi, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm from uh, Renfrewshire Council. I uh, work in the procurement unit there. It was just a very quick question to Tracy and something I was uh, looking at this morning. I've been expecting a bit of an update on Fair Work First from the Scottish Government, and I was just wondering if there was any update that you can give just now, because it's uh, quite important for some of the work we're doing on community wealth building. Uh, particularly under the workforce and spending pillar. Thanks for that question, Roy. Yes, I believe that there is some work underway in terms of our, our colleagues Rosie and the team there. I don't actually have an update at the moment for you, but I'll take a note of that and go back to the team and make sure that I can get something for you. So hopefully that'll help. Excellent. Thanks very much, Tracy. OK, great. Thanks, Roy. Um, do we have anyone else? And uh, Hayley Green. OK, Hayley. 
Yeah, hi, thanks very much. Hayley Green from Orkney Islands Council. Um, it was just a question, it's a sort of, I think it's more of a, a an in principle question, really. it's about anchor institutions and specifically working with colleagues in the NHS. Um, one of the issues we've had here in Orkney, we already spend quite a lot of our um, income, or sorry, expenditure locally anyway, especially as an island that gives, we've got some advantages on that. But in terms of sort of looking at joint procurement or collaborative procurement with NHS colleagues, one of the issues we come across a lot is that they have, of course, their national procurement framework and often they're not as able to look at procurement in, in a way that in, even in areas where we think that could be possible. So is there any sort of, uh, I mean, I guess it's, it's a question for you, Tracy, but I guess more broadly, any areas where people have managed to kind of crack that national procurement versus locally based procurement and, and any advice for us on that, because that would be really key. So first of all, if I come back in, Hayley, just to say that you're actually echoing something that we've been hearing quite a lot of in terms of the feedback around the flexibility, not just for the NHS, but for some of our other anchor institutions like the police and the fire service. So we are looking to talk to Public Health Scotland and NHS at the moment about what we can do about that and how we can try and see if there is some way of bringing some more flexibility into that. I'm sure some of the other pilot areas as they pick up in terms of their own um, and sessions within this um, may well actually be able to give you some examples of how they've done this on the ground. Um, but at the moment we are engaging in some national level conversations to try and help with that. OK, that's great. Um, do I see, is it David Somerville? There's a hand up. Hello, David. Fred. I, I popped the question in the, in the chat. Anchor institutions have traditionally um, been really considered as publicly funded bodies. But there are, say, in Edinburgh, um, quite a lot of financial institutions who are pretty stuck to Edinburgh <laughs> um, and not likely to be fleeing to Cambodia to some far eastern place. What's the view? Um, and, and it's maybe something we can discuss later uh, after you've gone, Tracy. But what's the Scottish government view about taking a slightly wider view of other uh, large institutions um, who might be brought into the fold, who might bring some resource into the fold? I think you've actually hit on a key uh, question that we were discussing this morning with Ted actually in terms of the role of the private sector in, in community wealth building. And I think there is a recognition that we can't do this alone. So we do need to engage with our private sector colleagues and where they do have a tie to place, what we want to do is help them to maximise their impact in that and see themselves as, as actually having influence over that local economy and the benefits that they, their intervention can actually bring to it. And again, um, it is something that we're exploring further. OK, I can't see unless, oh, sorry, we do have another one. Chris Cook. Chris, want to come in? Yeah, hi, thanks. Yeah, just um, just a quickie. I mean, procurement and local procurement has been an interest of mine since I actually formulated a policy ooh, 15 years ago, which was adopted by the Scott Lib Dems in 2007. <clears throat> but look what happened. And, um, and it was mutual guarantee, uh, local gar mutual guarantee or mutual assurance of local procurement. You know, essentially, you can form what is, you know, call it a, a user group, a club, or uh, of local contractors, and they can back up performance with a mutual assurance that the performance would be up to snuff. You could back that up with financial guarantees if you wanted, but the idea sank without trace with the Lib Dems at the time. But you know, personally, I think the policy was a good one, and we took it to Norway instead. So um, you know, but you know, if you're interested, I could send you. Um, some information on it because it will definitely work it's how the shipping industry actually mutually assures risks that uh, lloyds of london won't take it's called a pni club protection and indemnity club so you know and it and it fits with the whole mutual aid thing you know that this this burgeoning of mutuality i i think and the beauty of that is tracy you don't need legislation for it anyway I'll shut up. No, that's great chris i think you've mentioned you've been at other events where that you've brought this up as well i'm sure so um yeah. Yeah, so obviously there's a link there, Tracy. You can you can send that on. This, obviously, these events are all about sharing, so that's an important. It's two way. Um, so thanks for that, Chris. Um, Sheila, I think you've got your hand up as well. Sheila Tolmy. Hi there. Hi. Yeah, I'm Sheila Tolmy. I'm the community impact lead for Robertson Construction, the group. Um, so I'm representing Stephen Trainer today, and so Stephen sends his apologies, but he asked me to to join your your group. So thank you for 
um, doing this today. Um, Robertson, as a group, we very much into social value and a lot of our frameworks and contracts are all about that. So depending on who our client is and whichever framework we're on, that's something we have to deliver against against each project. So employability, education, um, there's a variety of different things that we do. Um, so I suppose really for us, it's just to sort of find out how much of a joined up approach we can have to what you're uh, trying to do here. Um, and it's it's helpful for us for going forward for our own strategy about how we fit that in with the community wealth building strategy and what you how we can help with that. Um, but I feel that we are already we do this on every project that we get involved in. So we add the value to the community, whether that's local spend, local engagement. Um, we do apprenticeships, work placements, all sorts of different things. So. OK, it's Trace, I don't know if you want to respond yeah. to any of what you've obviously there have been people sharing um, yeah. I think useful information for you to be uh, aware of. Absolutely. No, I think that's really useful. And Chris, thank you for putting the link in the chat. Um, Sheila, in terms of um, yourself and Robertson Construction, if you want, I'm more than happy to have an offline conversation with yourself. We can arrange a meeting so we can have a discussion around how your current approaches can fit in with community wealth building and how we can actually build that up and take it forward. Um, it might be of interest for you to know that um, the steering group that I talked about in um, Balfour Beatty as one of the members of the Business Services Association is actually represented. So it may well be that I can pass you on and some contact details there as well, but I'm more than happy to have a conversation offline with you and, and set something up if that would be useful. OK, Tracy, thank you. Yes, that would be great. Thanks. OK, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you don't mind. I was just wanting to bring in um, any questions and, and contributions at this point. It's not, I know we we're going to roll straight on to the next speaker, but I'm just aware you're you're leaving, Tracy. So I thought it was quite important we have that opportunity. Um, OK, so thanks, everybody. Tracy, good. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate your input. Um, obviously, you'll get to see the recording at the end <laughs> once we're finished, if you can bear it. <laughs> OK, so we're now going to move on to um, hear from Fife Council um, about how community wealth building can and, and is being incorporated into council uh, corporate strategies as a means to addressing major priorities, including local economic recovery and development, tackling poverty and addressing climate change. And to cover this, I'd like to welcome Sinead O'Donnell, who's a project manager with Fife Council. And she leads the reform priority of community wealth building as part of the delivery arrangements um, for the plan for Fife. Um, Sinead has previously led on a range of policy areas in Fife, including community planning, regeneration um, initiatives and neighbourhood planning. Um, and her other areas of expertise um, and interest include tackling poverty and inequality and strengthening the community voice um, in the public sector. So really keen to hear what you've got to say, Sinead. Um, and over to you. And I think you're going to share slides with us as well, aren't you? Yep, that's right. Thanks very much, Liz. And thanks to EDAS for inviting Fife along to share our experience so far in our community wealth building journey. In terms of the presentation, um, I'd just like to set out our strategic approach to community wealth building uh, across Fife Council and Fife Partnership. I'll maybe point to some of the challenges and opportunities and the choices that this brings for us and share some thoughts on what any new community wealth building legislation uh, might offer us. So if someone can just confirm they can see that lovely hashtag our Fife, that would be great. Yep. Yes, okay. you can see it. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. So if you don't know or you haven't been to Fife, firstly, you should go. It's a fantastic place full of wonderful people and wonderful places. Um, it's often described as a bit of a microcosm of Scotland due to its urban and rural mix, coastal, industrial, coal mining legacy, in Central and West Fife and fishing, farming and tourist attractions in North East Fife. Um, and as most of the colleagues on the call will know, with that type of history comes many con contrasts and fortunes for people and communities. And in Fife, we see that as many of you all do with great places of wealth and affluence, with very close neighbours, with high levels of poverty and inequality and all the associated uh, problems that this brings. Um, if we think about how Fife has gone on to try and address tackling poverty and inequality, this lovely tube station diagram here sets out our journey, really tracking back to a Fairness Matters report, which was an independent poverty commission exercise undertaken in 2015. 
Uh, we then had our plan for five, our 10 year plan, our LOIP, taking us 2017 to 2027. Um, in terms of the Fairness Matters report, that really looked at the scale and the scope and the nature of poverty in Fife and the effectiveness of our current activity. Um, and it led to the 10 year plan really setting out a bold ambition to address root causes, putting fairness at the heart of that 10 year plan. And the priority themes there are on the left from the 2017 plan. Um, opportunities for all thriving places, inclusive growth and in jobs and community led uh, services. However, we know from um, strategic assessment exercises that were undertaken since that time and up to 2020, that the action we were taking wasn't having the impact we'd hoped for in terms of our key outcomes. Uh, Fife was tracking the national average either just above or just below. And at that time, we took a decision to reset the 10 year plan, have a three year refresh. Um, and that led to a political decision by our joint administration at the time to explore community wealth building models in England. And there were learning visits and then an engagement with CLES to come to Fife to develop our baseline report and a series of recommendations that might take forward our community wealth building approach. Um, the work in Fife was led by our chief executive, so it's quite important to know it had political buy-in, senior leadership buy-in, and the ambition is really organisation-wide. So as such, um, we reset this recovery and renewal plan for 21-24 with community wealth building as the approach across the whole of the document with three very sharp priorities which are set out in the middle there leading economic recovery, tackling poverty and preventing crisis and addressing the climate emergency. And I think it's important to set out that community wealth building is very much positioned as the approach, the mechanism um, that we're hoping to recover from the pandemic, renew our public services uh, and realign our plans and strategies in a different way. Doing more of the same just won't work. Our assessment and our experience is telling us that. So we've tried to have a sharper focus on these three cross-cutting areas. Um, and that's led to this adoption of the three-year plan, which was adopted in August 2021 by Fife Partnership. Um, and just by way of context, the, the plan for Fife uh, is also Fife Council's plan. There is no separate, separate plan. So um, this diagram is taken from the plan document itself. And as you can see, it sets out the renewal landscape on the left, kind of national and local in the context we're operating in, the positioning of community wealth building at the centre with the three priorities around the side. Um, I just draw your attention to the, the blue circle of strategy for change. Um, and, I th and I think what we're trying to express there is really around the alignment of strategy, joint teams, joint leadership, place-based approaches, volunteers, and fundamentally redesigning systems, processes, and the how of service delivery. That's what is going to be different and going beyond traditional partnership working to having an ambition to um, unite public services in a different way, very much in the way that we experienced through the pandemic, where there was lots of positive advances made there. Um, OK, I'll just see what my next slide is. This slide here, um, a good example of uh, a project um, which built on community led work, volunteers, NHS, Fife Council, um, and lots of learning came from that about place based approaches. Um, embedding community wealth building in the Fife partnership commitment and across all anchors is fundamental to Fife's approach. So whilst the local authority might be leading and currently in the chair of the arrangements, it's very much a, a partnership ambition. Um, and we have the belief that by all anchors taking similar actions at the same time, this will hopefully achieve the scale and impact from our public sector resources and the shift in our key outcomes that we're hoping for. The slide here is looking at the commitments on the left as set out in our 
refreshed plan, a recovery and renewal plan, that three year sharper focus document. So the priorities and the commitments on the left is what Fife Partnership has signed up to, all anchor institutions. Um, and you'll note that I've highlighted bullet point four, which is really very much trying to fundamentally shift the whole system, um, redesigning systems and processes. And for me, that's the element that's very much within our gift. And I think I expressed there it's with it's our choice. So we can do a lot of a lot of positive things if we have the, the courage um, to do so. So uh, on the right hand side, there are the specifics that are in our community wealth building delivery plan. Um, I think there are eight outcomes there that we're hoping to achieve. These were signed off and approved by our uh, leadership group just in early April. Uh, and these are the ambitions we have um, for Fife Partnership um, through our Community Wealth Building Delivery Plan. This diagram sets out our leadership and governance arrangements. Uh, in addition to the core work of the partnership groups, which are on the right, which are still striving against their 10 year ambition document. On the left, we have some very senior level delivery boards that have been established for the three reform areas and they report into the recovery and renewal leadership group. Community wealth building isn't expressed explicitly on the diagram um, to mirror that ambition that it's throughout all of our approach and all of our reform work and our efforts are making that that shift. Where we have set up some specific dedicated uh, focus on community wealth building is through a senior partner delivery group that has representation from all anchors at a very senior level who have the authority to pull the levers to make changes in their organisation. Um, and we've set about developing a one year delivery plan that is explicitly based on those um, eight areas that were on the previous slide, where we think that that's within our gift to inject some pace and development work over the next year to really advance and build on the good foundations that we've already got. So I've kind of described that as the green lights. We have um, developed a community wealth building anchor charter similar to North Ayrshire colleagues, which has been adopted by Fife Council, Fife Voluntary Action, and is Fife College and is making its way through the other organisation and boards towards July this year. And that's just setting out that high level commitment. We have the green light to go ahead with uh, ambitious one year delivery plan to build on the good work we already have. And we're now in the space of um, scoping very specific projects to try and advance um, pieces of work across different organisations. So the priority projects, uh, we've already got much good work in relation to procurement and economic development and supply chain work. Our baseline position is very good, but we have an ambition to go further and there's scope and work there related to community benefit clauses. Um, in terms of public sector recruitment, Fife Council's HR is undertaking a workforce profiling exercise linked to SIM data zones um, and targeting entry level uh, public sector post to particular groups or geographies and marrying up with employability programmes. Um, and we have an ambition in our delivery plan by October of this year to have a single anchor asset register across all the public sector in Fife. And in terms of resourcing this ambition and this action plan, there's very much been a, a position taken that the senior leads are responsible for driving the projects and are accountable to the group and the leadership board and that the intention is to use existing mainstream resources um, to make these shifts so that at the core of our organisations we're leading change from within the systems, the processes, the people and our practice rather than a standalone community wealth building team to the side. Um, and that's the approach we've taken to drive this work over the next year. In terms of opportunities and challenges, I've kind of positioned on the left there that we have chief officer buy-in, we have good practice and joint leadership approaches. We've set out to renew 
our public services to realign our plans and strategies through a community wealth building lens. Um, our ambition is mainstream, it's system wide, and we have a good place to start from. That all sounds really great, and that's what we're hoping to do. Um, in terms of our challenges, you know, incremental just won't do. do. Do we have a radical, bold shift in us? That's the conversations we're having. How do we make those shifts? Um, we've got a backdrop of social urgency in terms of a growing inequalities and crisis and you know additional demand on services that it isn't easy to change established practice and big bureaucracies and how do we overcome some of those issues um but ultimately we are being given leadership permission at every level to be creative and be courageous but that can feel risky too so in terms of having backup and support for what we're doing at a national level that might be some comfort in going forward um, and the challenge moving all of this work from the margin to the mainstream that's where we will get the greatest benefits and just a final slide really um, Tracy pointed to emerging legislation around community wealth building um, and I think it's important if we try and think together about some ideas that we can use that legislation to have greatest impact through the bill development pro process. Um, I've put a number of points there that have come to mind that might help advance this agenda. They're related to progressive procurement practice, uh, to fair work and real living wage. Can these things be mandated? Um, can we make greater use of land and assets for social purposes? And are there opportunities in the planning system to get more community benefit, for example, from Section 75 arrangements? Um, so those are just some thoughts from me. Um, this is our chance to try and shape that legislation to unlock and remove some of the barriers that might be prohibiting being courageous and being creative and, and making progress with community wealth building. Um, always like to end with a happy little picture. So in terms of you know sharing Fife's approach and Fife's journey um, and how we are setting out to rewire our system and embed this in our strategic approach, it would be helpful to know how that how that feels for you, how it chimes with your own work and you know any feedback and discussions welcome to to help us. Thanks very much. That was great, Sinead. Thank you so much. Um, a really, I think, thorough um, and quite detailed um, overview of what's been and how progress is being made um, across Fife. Um, and some really interesting points there about that leadership mandate um, and uh, the partners who are involved. So yes, the council's key in all of this, but it's great to see that, that greater ownership um, and leadership on this, and it's part of the five plan. Um, can I ask if do we have any questions? We have um, a few minutes that we can uh, take to still to put questions to Sinead um, on on her points and comments. Maybe if I if I could just kick off just with one Sinead um, to give people a chance to think. Um, how how would you say? I mean, the anchor charter seems like an important statement to be making and setting out. Um, you know, aspirations and, and, and demonstrating that collective leadership approach. How important would you say that that was in this process? And yeah, I think it was very important, Liz, because I think when we initially, um, you know, reset to have community wealth building at the heart of the recovery and renewal plan, there was an assumption that all partners were on the same page as the council and the politicians after having been on their learning visit, reading widely, being inspired by others, that it, it needed us to take a few steps back to share knowledge and understanding um, and to put this concept and practice into very plain language. And I think yeah. the production of the charter is just a piece of paper in itself, but if it helps people understand and view their work through that lens, um, and has a mandate in their organisation, it, it was helpful in the development and learning pro process. Um, and as I say, it's journey to being signed off, hopefully by July, um, across all anchors. Yeah, yeah, OK. Um, do we have any other questions for Sinead before we, because we can move on to the other speakers, but I would just want to check, do we have any? Just check in the chat box as well, in case there's anything. I'm not seeing 
anything coming up. So thanks very much, Sinead. I'm sure no problem. I, you're welcome. We'll, we'll come on to more questions as we go on. So if you're staying for the rest of the session, maybe you can contribute to that as well. Um, OK, we're going to move on now um, to consider contributions from um, other local authorities on um, four of the five community wealth building pillars. Um, and to begin with, we're going to hear from Alison Davidson, who's team leader, leader with, um, in economic development with Clark Manager Council. And she's going to focus on advancing um, fair work and the living wage through a fair work charter. Um, now, Alison has been with Clark Manager Council since March of last year where she's in charge of a range of employability programmes um, through Clax Works. She has a background in estates management and business development um, experience she brings to her current role in chairing the local business support partnership. Um, her role at Click Manager Council includes, as I say, supporting the Clax Works and obviously um, leading um, on uh, community wealth building from this perspective. So, Alison, over to you. And again, we're just going to, I think you have um, slides that you're going to put up for us as well. Yeah. Hi everybody, nice to meet you all. Um, I'm just going to put some very basic slides on, nothing like Sinead's lovely presentation from Fife Council. Can you see that okay? I can't see anybody. Yeah, that's, good. So, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Um, there we go, Clip Manager. Good employment. So I, as Liz said, I started with Clip Manager Council last March, so I still feel very new. Um, previously to that, I worked with Business Gateway and Clip Manager, so quite close to the business community. And I got um, into this Good Employment Charter working group quite early on last March, April time when it was just being set up to really involve the business community side of things. So the work we've done so far on the, the Good Employment Charter and Clip Manager, the background was that um, Claire's prepared a community wealth building uh, report for us in Clip Manager and presented it to the council in November 2020 with some recommendations and action points. Recommendation 18 was to adopt a Clip Manager leader good employment charter um, and some suggestions on how that could be formed. So the next thing we did was set up a working group in April 2021 with members from the Clip Manager Alliance organisations, that's the Council, University of Stirling, Central Scotland Police, NHS Fourth Valley, Third Sector Interface, Fourth Valley College. We also had representation on the group from Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Government and Clays um, to give us some advice on the way. So bi-monthly meetings from April 21, we invited union representatives to attend and to contribute. Um, there was general agreement that we would follow the Scottish Government Fair Work Framework and a draft charter was agreed with six pledges around the same as the Fair Work, the effective voice, opportunity, security, fulfilment, well-being and respect. This draft was taken to our first full meeting of our newly formed anchor partnership in January this year. And someone asked earlier, but our anchor partnership includes some of our bigger private sector companies as well as public sector organisations. Um, everybody generally supportive of a Clip Manager Good Employment Charter, including the private companies. There were some suggestions for change, including a consideration of a pledge around the environment net zero agenda. So we took it away from that meeting and did some consultation with Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Government, Keep Scotland Beautiful, um, on what appropriate wording should be for an environmental pledge. And we produced a further draft charter incorporating some wording around the environment and net zero agenda. So both versions without the environment and with the environment were taken to the Clip Manager Business Support Partnership and to the Good Employment Charter Working Group. And it was gen agreed that we would take forward the version with the environmental pledge as it was seen to be uh, an important uh, pledge to include. So. The next, that's where we, we've got to. The next steps are that the agreed final draft is still to be presented to the next meeting of the Anchor Partnership. Um, it's been delayed for various reasons, elections, updating of the Clip Manager wellbeing LOIP, but hopefully that will be happening over June, July time. And we need agreement from the uh, Anchor Partnership that they are all willing to sign up to this and we'll present the final version to the Clip Manager Alliance and we will be looking for all the Alliance organisations to sign up to it as well. 
We need some agreement on our opportunity pledge, which is around the priority groups we want to support. We've still to bottom that out and that will take into account things that we're doing around the city region deal and transformation zones in, in Cot Manager as well. Um, then the next step will be to, to arrange a workshop with the anchor partners to agree how we can implement it and setting up a subgroup to, to look at how we consider how we can take it forward and roll it out to other businesses across Clipman and Shire. So there's a lot still to be done on it, as you can see. And challenges, first of all, getting the agreement from the anchor organisations and the alliance to the wording, commitment to implement it across those organisations. Um, I'm struggling a bit with how it's going to work in practice. How do we roll it out? Um, how can we get businesses to commit to it? The ongoing monitoring of that, there's resource issues around it. Um, you know, our, our, our organisations, is it just a bit of paper they sign and then stick it away somewhere? And how do we know that they're doing what they're they're signed up to do? We don't want it just to be a bit of paper and um, we want to make it meaningful and encourage businesses to sign up to the charter. There was some concern from the business support partners. There are Clip Manager Business Support Partnership was set up at the beginning of lockdown and we're continuing. It's a good forum. It includes Fourth Valley Chamber of Commerce, College, Developing Young Workforce and um, Federation of Small Businesses, our Club Manager Tourism Group, Visit Scotland, Scottish Enterprise. So it's all the sort of business support, business gateway are in there as well, business support agencies. And they felt it's maybe not the right time to be asking businesses to commit to something else. And um, there's an awful lot going on just now. But so th these are all the challenges. And do we have different levels of commitment, gold and silver, for example? So loads of challenges, but that's where we've got to. And um, the next step is just to get it signed off and agreed and then set up a subgroup to find out how we can roll that out across the county. So I'm going to come back. If anybody's got any questions, I am happy to answer them. OK, oh, can we get the screen back again? Okay, I don't. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> OK, <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thanks very much, Alison. Um, that was great. That was, that was a, a good overview for us. I think, you know, whistle stop tour through progress so far um, and very much on the journey um, by, by the sounds of it. Um, does it before I just check, I'm not sure I'm seeing um, hands going up at the moment, um, but I suppose I just wonder the comment that you're making there about um, from the business support partners about the timing of all of this. And of course, you know, we're looking at clearly we're not doing any of this in a vacuum and we know the stresses and strains that you know businesses are are um are experiencing you know as a result of the last two years and um never mind you know increases in energy prices and staffing and so on so i'm just wondering you know is, do you want can you say any more about you know just right now kind of how businesses are responding to this what your senses of that the the businesses on the anchor are very supportive of it and and keen to take it forward so i'm hoping they will help form a subgroup with me to, to see how we might roll that out. There's businesses, we, we did a small discretionary fund last year, and in the application we asked businesses to give us an indication of whether they would be interested in a good employment charter. Now, it's probably because they all wanted to grant, they all ticked yes, but <laughs> that's my, my basis of about 30 businesses in Clip Manager that at least have heard the words mentioned and might be a good starting point for us to have a kind of group session around as to how they might see that rolling out. Yeah, yeah. OK, OK, that's good to know. Um, Sheila, again, do you have your hand up? Yeah, in? I do. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Alison. Thank you for yeah. that. Um, so Robertson Construction, what we're trying to do as a group at the moment is as well, because of our social value um, objectives and our net zero obligations as well, we are putting together almost a similar sort of charter around getting our supply chain to sign up to delivering on social value against our projects. And I guess it's you sort of said before as well about all the challenges right now. And in construction, for example, there's a lot of challenges that we're having to do a lot of value engineering because of the price of um, materials have gone up so much. So when you've already, you know, um, let's just say nailed a subcontractor down to a price for delivering against a project, and then you ask them to add more value to that by committing to taking on apprentices, works placements, um, donations of materials and things like that that we do, it is very tricky. So I can completely understand where you're coming from. Um, but it's, it's, I really do wish you luck with that one. That sounds really good. Thank you. 
thank you. Yeah, the other um, the other organisation who are a bit concerned about it is our third sector interface representing all our social enterprises, because one of the pledges is around living wage and and they really have some concerns about that. So we don't want to insist that every business signs up to every pledge. It's working towards is how we're we're placing it and it's just how we we then get that in, into um, place and, and rolled out. So that's where we're at. I suspect there are some interesting conversations either being had or to, to be had with your third sector um, partners and all of this, uh, Alison, around, you know, uh, I don't doubt that the majority, if not all third sector organisations would be willing um, to, you know, certainly to 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 sign up to this and to to offer, you know, fair work and living wage and all all of the rest of it. But there's um, there are always issues out there in terms of full cost recovery for services that are delivered under contracts. So you know that's going to be an interesting uh, conversation. I think that if it's yeah. not already happening, <laughs> I'm sure they they do offer a lot of these these third sector organisations offer other benefits. So we're trying to get away from it doesn't have to be um, paying living wage. There's other things they are doing in terms of flexible working and opportunities for people. So, yeah, I'm sure there's a way around it. It's just getting our heads around how we do it. So. OK, OK, that's interesting. I can see, is it Jackie? Jackie Brereton, I think you're, you also have your hand up, Jackie. Do you want to come in? Yes, thanks, Liz. Um, it's really a question for both Alison and Sinead around their engagement and comm strategy. Um, they're both quite rural areas and obviously the vast majority of businesses in those areas are small and micro. I just wondered how they were actually communicating the principles of CWB and what they're doing to that audience. Thanks. OK, who wants to go first? Well, yeah, I'll just respond to that. Um, I, I think in Fife we have quite established uh, business networks, business connections, um, uh, comms and routine distribution and good personal relationships with a lot of the sector. So colleagues in economic development, colleagues in their communities directorate, uh, colleagues in procurement, uh, working on supply chain, etc. and business development, they are routinely our contacts with those businesses. So using existing networks um, and communications routes um, is the way that we would distribute information. In terms of language around community wealth building, I would just say that we, we've kind of taken a little bit of a different um, route to promotion because we've had a lot of feedback that the language of community wealth building itself uh, can be quite difficult for people to understand and engage with. So tackling poverty and inequality, promoting employment, promoting jobs, getting good outcomes for people, communities and neighbourhoods. That is the type of plain language conversational approach we would take to engage in with, with others. Um, and I'm mindful that we have a national agenda that's very overtly community wealth building and we have it in our plan. But in terms of um, public engagement, it's sometimes a different narrative that's usefully used. Okay. Alison, do you have any comments you would like to respond to Jackie on? Not really, uh, Jackie. Our, our main links with business business communications is through the business support partnership and all the mailings and the membership of those organisations and through Business Gateway with very close relationship with our Business Gateway colleagues in the area. Um, in terms of the community wealth building, we started that, we had managed our business week and we had our chief exec and um, leader of the council both talking to businesses at various events and talking about community wealth building. So we've started those, you know, conversations and but we've got a, a way to go in terms of the, the communications around it, I think. Uh, and thanks for raising that, Jackie, because I think, you know, really valid point there and, and good to have that kind of, you know, uh, I suppose flagged as something for all of the partners here um, to be considering today if they haven't done so already. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to move on now um, to our next contributor, who is Ruri Kelly from Glasgow City Council. Um, now, we've just obviously been looking at the fair work, fair employment dimension. We're now going to move on to the land and property pillar and seeing how ideas are being advanced here um, within, within Glasgow. Um, and he's going to give us some input on how vacant and derelict land is being tackled in Glasgow um, using community wealth building principles. So welcome, Ruri. Thanks for joining us. 
sure you're a, a busy, a busy man, so we do appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be here today. So can I hand over to you? Are you and you're just speaking to our audience, aren't you? We don't have slides for you, I don't uh, think. I do have a couple of slides at email. Oh, right, OK. Um, I'm just I don't have the share function actually on my screen, so. I'll just share them for you, Rudy, if, uh, if that's OK. Super. Yeah, I've got them here. Brilliant. OK, so yep, thanks a lot for having us along. I'll just do a wee quick run through of kind of what we've done in Glasgow to get us to this point, because some of it fit, uh, factors into to what we're doing with the vacant and derelict land. So we'd agreed a full uh, uh, a motion at full council to adopt a, a community wealth building approach to, to policy making across the council. So that's kind of resulted in, you know, a a bit of work to see where we are in terms of baselining and also education for both councillors and officers as to to what that really means and how it has to be kind of embedded from the beginning of discussions as opposed to tagged on on at the end as an addendum so we've been looking at through all of our departments what we've been doing that would would essentially be community wealth building at the minute but hadn't just been badged as such um, and then uh, an engagement process has begun with our anchor organisations to do a similar mapping to get an idea of, of what there is across the city. That will have been done sort of in tandem with the city region as well, because many of the, the anchor organisations within the city will be the same anchor organisations for the, the city region. And the next step then is creating a, a community wealth building action plan that both the council and hopefully our anchor organizations can agree to and sign up to as some of the other contributors have been saying it, it's about getting that sort of across the board agreement because we're all sort of aware that, that this isn't something that's just done by councils or just done by public bodies if it's going to be successful it needs to be sort of across the the width and breadth of, of our city economy and um, if you could just move on to the next slide for us then please as I say, the slides are more just a, a background on what's happened so far. Um, in terms of our procurement, again, focus on community benefits, but not only um, and what we can get out of them, but the, the delivery of them. So now we have a supplier sort of ranking system or award system where if you have achieved 50% of it, you get your uh, bronze supplier. If you achieve 100% of it, your silver. And if you go over and above, you get gold. The next step, though, is that if that is not delivered, then th there would be consequences the next time people come for tender. So you would maybe start with a, a reduction in your your overall score, because our view is that if this is a contractual obligation and you haven't delivered it, then you haven't delivered on the contract. It's no different than getting contracted to deliver a bridge and leaving some of the suspension wires out. So we're keen to ensure that throughout the whole process and um, supporting consortium bids uh, so that social enterprises, smaller local uh, companies can come together to bid for the larger contracts that can be more difficult to break up and then identifying contracts that would be specifically suited to um, social enterprises and uh, support capacity building in the sector so that they can either bid for the contracts or potentially um, be available to have the community benefits subcontract subcontracted to them if there's large uh, contracts that that we would be able to fit that in. So that kind of as I say leads on to um, the, the vacant and delic land because a lot of that has been about you know, building the capacity with whether it's social enterprises, community organisations, charities in, in our local communities to have a bigger say in, in what happens with the the land that has been, as I say, vacant and dialect often for quite some time due to the industrialisation, the removal of tenement houses, etc. Um, and one of the ex really good examples of meeting I'm just out of um, in Rakesi, uh, in my part of the city, where in Glasgow over 60% of people live within 500 metres of vacant and uh, derelict land. In Rukesi, 100% of the population live within 500 metres of a vacant and derelict site. So what we have done there is work with the community um, through the, the Rukesi pantry that was set up um, a couple of years ago by a colleague, um, set up a development trust who have then 
bid for funding through some of our area partnership, been able to get some money to do a feasibility study, uh, engage with a local architecture firm who's helped do some of the community engagement. And in the last week there, we've just been successful in getting 670,000 from the vacant dialect land fund, which will be used to turn two old school sites into uh, an area of sort of public growing space and um, adventure playground orchards and basically everything else that came out of the community consultation. So what was or still is a, a vacant and derelict site through that sort of community empowerment angle has been turned into what we hope will be a real sort of node for the community. It'll have your uh, essentially be a new public space that people will have had control of from the inception of the idea right the way through to the delivery and then the the sort of jobs volunteer and opportunities and everything else that's created out of that being controlled by the community as opposed to the council does the bid the council does the work the council maintains it afterwards and it's just done to communities rather than rather than with them um, one of the other uh, sort of strands to this that we've really tried to push is a more liberal use of compulsory purchase powers. Um, many of those have been uh, through like vacant homes, which become a blight on our communities. We all know that the housing uh, difficulties that all of our communities have in terms of the availability of stock. So we've really encouraged our, our officers to have a, a much more sort of, as I say, liberal use of that. We've ha had over 150 homes in the last five years, compulsory purchases purchased and then handed over to our uh, housing association partners. But it's not only just with the houses we've. In Springburn, there was a, an old bar that had been lying in the middle of a community, burnt out for over 20 years, total eyesore and, you know, just the the impact that has on the people that are living next to it, you know, a total sort of desolation in the area and, and makes people feel like nobody cares about the area. So we tried, first of all, to engage with the owner to encourage them to, to knock it down and repurpose the land. And whenever that didn't seem to be getting anywhere, we brought a, a paper to committee to compulsory purchase the property and um, because of the, the social and emotional impact that it was having on the residents. And lo and behold, within two weeks, the diggers were in to, to knock the building down. So uh, one of the things that we were kind of you know, keen to explore was the ability for councils to use the existing legislation and really the, the muscle or the might that, that they have and sometimes don't realise to ensure that the good work that we need done in communities it is done more quickly than than it would be if you had to go through the entire court process etc and as you say we were quite prepared to go through all of that with the compulsory purchase but it turned out that as i say that the threat of that and the pursuit of that um work and it ended with with the owner doing that himself and now he's engaging um, with the community for a total sort of redevelopment plan of the area and and how we can work together for that rather than um, sort of adversarially. Another program that we have in in Glasgow is the the People Make Glasgow's Communities program, and that again is about sort of community empowerment for better use of whether it's facilities, whether it's old buildings or vacant land that. The council is either not in a position or doesn't have the, the focus to be able to um, spend the money and time on that specific area. But if if a council or if a community group themselves were focusing on on one single uh, site, that that would uh, allow then for a much more kind of focused and uh, dedicated outcome to be arrived at. So one of the examples of that is a, a football um, center that was probably underutilized by Glasgow Life um, and during the pandemic had to be closed down due to our, our difficulties in running services that everybody will be familiar with. Um, but we were able to engage with a, a local charitable organization and a couple of local football teams who have taken on sort of a joint ownership of that on a long term lease. So 
It's remaining uh, as a publicly owned facility, but they're going to take on the management of it. In the last number of months, they've been able to bring in over 1.5 million for redevelopment. They've got a, quite a number of young people working in it through Kickstarter program uh, and other job opportunities, training opportunities for some of the parents through kind of UEFA coaching badges and, and really sort of turned around the, the fortunes of that and really turned it into sort of a football centre of excellence in the East End of Glasgow. So very much of our um, bacon and derelict land use and bringing these assets which really they are. I mean, the land is an asset to the community if, if it's used properly. It's been about that sort of community empowerment aspect of it, working with local people, uh, existing organisations to deliver what people tell us that they want in their communities, as opposed to ticking a, a box on what the council thinks they want and then delivering it when we get round to applying for, for funding. Um, because as I say, a lot of these community organisations if they're focusing on, on one asset, they can be quicker, more nimble, apply for different fundings that maybe council organisations can't, and we can get through a lot more of them than if they, they sit on a list waiting to get done with, with council departments. OK, thanks, Rory. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, and, you know, again, a really a really good overview, of some incredible examples there of what you're doing. Um, I, I can't and also the, the tools as well that um, that empower people um, within the council to actually you know make some of these changes you know around compulsory purchase orders for example um, I'm just I can't resist asking you this question because of all our speakers today you're part of the leadership team within the local authority obviously um, so I, I just want to just ask you before I invite anybody else to get any questions um, to what extent do you think now community wealth building is absolutely embedded in you know the mindset if you like of the leadership of your of your local authority um, to what extent do you think it's altered the way that things have been done from, say, a few years ago within uh, within Glasgow City Council? You've been there since 2017. Have you seen a shift? Yeah. Um, definitely there's been a, a shift in terms of our understanding of it and then kind of, I think, pushing for more and more of, of an implementation of it. I think obviously the pandemic has really changed um, people's focus in terms of, you know, your 20 minute neighbourhoods, what it's like for people in their own communities as whereas in the past it might have been very much about just getting in the foreign direct investment just about economic development but without you know kind of the, the broader picture of how does that impact normal people's everyday lives you know because with the best will in the world bringing in big multinational companies might look good on a balance sheet but if it doesn't actually improve the lives of the people that are living in our communities is, is it what we're really there to be doing so i think there's been a, a big focus on on how we leverage in benefits from it whether that you know is financial whether it's sort of community support kind of benefits and again i think there's been a change in that in the last five years because just getting things like procurement mainstreamed throughout the council was the kind of the first hurdle and then it was the, the community benefits looking at stuff like that and as i say Whenever, say, the Barclays deal came to Glasgow, there was a big focus on on the community benefits, on, on employment of people from sort of more deprived backgrounds uh, and things like that. But now, again, as some others have mentioned, we're looking at more targeted benefits, you know, instead of tick box exercise of we'll do a speech in schools, we'll have, you know, X number of new starts. We're looking at, you know, the wish list side of things. What what's going to be more useful to our communities, to local organisations, say like a couple of hours of conveyancing for groups that are looking to take on um, vacant and derelict land and the legal advice side of things, maybe somebody in to help with their accounting. So if we are doing contracts through the, the council's procurement side, rather than some of the easier community benefits, we would be looking for, for things like that, that are, you know, beyond really the ability of of your local organizations to do themselves and can be quite prohibitively expensive. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, it's really, really interesting. It sounds like there are you know, ambitions there on your part to really kind of embed this. Um, I'm just noticing in the chat box is a comment about loving the procurement approach that Glasgow City Council has taken, which is great for the third sector. So that's a real endorsement there, um, Ruri. So thanks very much for that. Um, OK, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock here. We've still got a couple of presentations to go um, and I'm not seeing any hands coming up um, with any burning questions. So if we just move on to um, our sort of final speakers for this afternoon um, and we have a double act here um, this, with um, North Ayrshire Council. Um, we're going to now look um, at taking uh, really into account the kind of financial power pillars and the plural ownership uh, pillars um, with inputs from uh, Mary Patterson, who's Community Wealth Building Coordinator um, with North Ayrshire Council. Um, and we also have Jude, um, Jude King, who's Programme Manager with North Ayrshire Council. Um, and I believe you're going to do a bit of a double act, but first of all, sort of setting some theme um, and some context around where this fits with the, the growth deal. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, Liz. Thanks very much for, for having us here today. Um, my name is Barry Patterson. I'm Community Wealth Building Coordinator um, at North Ayrshire Council. Um, many of you will know about North Ayrshire and the fact that we launched, launched Scotland's first Community Wealth Building strategy in May 2020. Um, it's a long term strategy that we um, seek to embed Community Wealth Building in everything that we do um, and also about how the Council uses its economic power as an anchor institution to create an inclusive and wellbeing economy in, in North Ayrshire. Um, so myself and my colleague Jude King um, are going to deliver, as you say, a bit of a double act um, here today on our activities within within North Ayrshire um, and Ayrshire more broadly um, as well. So I'm going to provide a bit of a, an overview of our approach to community wealth building um, in North Ayrshire and in relation to financial power and ownership. Um, and then Jude will go into a little bit more detail about the community wealth building project that she manages as part of the Ayrshire Growth Deal. Hi, Barry. Sorry to interrupt. Could you just flick it to presentation mode? Oh, is it not on that? No, it's not. Not yet. Uh, hang on. I thought I did press that. There we go. We're still in. Oh, that's you now. That's it. Sorry, yeah, I must be a bit slow. Sorry yeah, to interrupt. Okay, Thanks, Alison. OK. Um, so as I said, we're, we're taking a council wide approach um, to community wealth building um, and we're working with the regional um, and local partners to embed community wealth building across the Ayrshire region. Um, and we've chosen to take an approach um, to work across all the pillars. Um, we believe it's important um, not necessarily to view the pillars in isolation, but see them as mutually supportive. Um, and think this is particularly the case um, in relation to, to um, ownership and financial power. Uh, it's important to recognise the role um, that the Council has as an anchor institution um, and the economic power it has, um, which an anchor institution which seeks to invest locally um, within businesses and community communities, um, but which also uses its financial and economic power to support and grow more diverse and democratic forms of ownership, um, thus spreading the wealth more broadly uh, within the region. So just in terms of some of the ways that the council is using its financial power, um, we're looking to invest and empower in our communities and we do that through um, our community investment fund. Um, some examples are Millpont Town Hall um, on the island of Cumbria um, and Stevenson Beach Hub. Um, you can find, an, find a little bit more about that example in our annual report, which we launched last year. Um, we're also continuing to empower our communities through participatory budgeting. Um, through our work closely with credit unions um, to look at developing financial literacy, encourage progressive finance options, um, but we're also exploring the feasibility of a mutually owned community bank um, as well. Other ways we're looking at promoting investment in our communities um, to regional and national institutions. Um, and the Ayrshire Growth Deal is a good example of how financial power um, and investment can be used to support fragile regional economies um, and grow more de democratic forms of ownership. 
Um, just to provide a bit of context, the growth deal itself is um, a £251 million investment in Ayrshire. Um, and one of the projects within the growth deal is a £3 million community wealth building fund, which amongst other things, um, provides support to local businesses to explore and transition to more democratic forms of ownership. And that's the, something that Jude's going to provide a little bit more detail on um, in a short time. In relation to encouraging more democratic forms of ownership, um, the council itself, and as part of, of that growth deal project I mentioned, um, has taken a number of steps um, to develop um, this culture in North Ayrshire. Um, so this includes taking a, a place-based locality approach um, to engage with communities and businesses um, and officers are aligned to specific localities um, and develop a good working knowledge and understanding of the local needs and aspirations um, leading to the relevant um, and tailored support to businesses um, and communities as well. So in terms of doing that, that kind of um, direct relationship with relationship building with localities. Officers support wider forms of business, business ownership uh, models, so employee ownership, cooperatives, uh, social enterprises can support them with procurement support and um, business transition and um, workplace innovation, sustainability goals um, amongst um, other things. The council is also looking at um, municipal ownership um, to advance community wealth building whilst also protecting um, services and I'll come on to a brief example on that um, in a couple of minutes. Um, we're also looking at how we use our land and property assets um, to develop um, low carbon and renewable energy schemes uh, as well. So just quickly in terms of an example um, that officers um, supported um, was uh, a few years ago, Ochrani Resort um, on the Isle of Arran, um, which was the first hospitality venue of its kind in Scotland um, to become employee owned. Uh, demonstrating that this type of model, um, which places more direction and power in the hands of employees, um, is, is possible for this type of business. Um, so a quick example of um, municipal ownership, where the capital investment um, from the council is being used to reduce carbon emissions, um, as demonstrated in um, plans um, for council-owned renewable energy generation um, at two former landfill sites in North Ayrshire. Um, and they're going to be used to site um, solar farms. Um, this is a great example because it cuts across various pillars of community wealth building, um, not only ownership and financial power, but land and assets, so using formerly unproductive land, um, procurement as well, so there's potential for local suppliers and supply chains um, to benefit during construction and operation. Um, but it's also about demonstrating um, green economic leadership um, and supports the Council's ambitions around municipalisation to safeguard and enhance public services, as well as reinvest the funds from any excess energy into tackling fuel poverty, fuel poverty for our, our most vulnerable residents as well. So I appreciate that's been a quick whistle stop tour, but hopefully those examples in that context is of use um, to you. And I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and I'll pass over to Jude who will provide a bit more detail on the Ayrshire Growth Deal project. Perfect. Thank you very much, Barry. Hopefully you all can see my slides OK. Um, so uh, as Barry said, um, I'm the program manager for the Ayrshire Growth Deal Community Wealth Building Programme. It's a pan Ayrshire programme between North, East and South Ayrshire councils seeking to tackle a range of well-documented Ayrshire challenges from high levels of deprived areas to low employment rates. Um, I joined the programme in November last year, but I understood the importance of community wealth building long before that, especially heightened through living on an island during the pandemic uh, for reasons that you can very well imagine. So um, yeah, I really believe in it. And today I'll give you a bit of an overview of the programme, talk a little bit about how the programme is an example of financial power and plural ownership across Ayrshire. So there are three core dimensions to the programme. Um, a core dimension is the community wealth building officers. There are three officers per local authority engaging and supporting businesses in adopting community wealth building principles. 
As you all know, Fair Work is one of the five pillars of community wealth building and the programme sees a Fair Work programme manager and uh, two officers to work with local enterprises, including anchor institutions across Ayrshire to improve the prospects of local people within work. Finally, there's a £1 million business fund that gives financial assistance through grants and consultancies or consultancy to enterprises adopting community wealth building in Ayrshire. And I'll give some example to this later on. So from what I understand, you're all very well versed on the different pillars of community wealth building. Um, and as we said, the Ayrshire Growth Deal is a superb example of financial power in action. So as Barry said, 251 million worth of funding from UK and Scottish governments, um, as well as um, facilitating 300 million of private investment to help realise um, the economic potential in Ayrshire, um, as well as creating up to 7,000 jobs as well. Um, it's an example of Scotland investing in Scotland, Scotland investing in Ayrshire, Ayrshire investing in Ayrshire, and that's the way it should be. Um, so in supporting enterprises in adopting community wealth building, the programme focuses on four out of five of the community wealth building pillars. And I will show you what that looks like in terms of quantifying um, the success of the programme. So we are seeking to engage with 920 enterprises in adopting community wealth building. And I'll give a case study example of this um, later. Um, 216 um, businesses have been supported in the first year of programme delivery. Uh, we aim to support 265 businesses financially and 50 businesses have been supported so far. Of course, we've experienced COVID and recruitment related challenges, which I'm sure a lot of you can kind of relate to. Examples are wide ranging um, from financial support for polytunnels to increase food growing um, to net zero feasibility studies. You'll see that I've highlighted the outputs relating to plural ownership. So far, four businesses have been supported in the transition to employee ownership and social enterprises, and 12 businesses have um, access plural ownership specialist support. So I wanted to give a bit of a bigger or bring a bit of a bigger perspective to the support we're offering businesses with this case study example. So let's compare um, local a local business to Amazon. A study by the Institute uh, for Self-Reliance showed that for every 19 jobs Amazon provides per million in 10 million in sales, a local business will provide 50. Amazon doesn't pay property tax due to having um, no physical shop facilities, whereas local retailers occupy valuable storefront locations and pay um, substantial taxes and business rates. Amazon invests little to nothing in local economies and communities where their customers reside, whereas I'm sure you can all think of uh, local businesses within your area that give back to the community um, through hampers, which is definitely a social currency here on Aaron, or sponsoring of uh, sports and other causes. In summary, Amazon exploits the planet and people to a level that they can undercut those that are doing things uh, more sustainably, more ethically. And through this exploitation, they can make their products more accessible, more affordable, more appealing, more convenient. Um, and it makes it really hard for local businesses to compete. Um, so living on an island, I uh, am guilty of paying for a prime membership, and it's not something I willingly or proudly admit. But what this program seeks to do is not tackle this on an individual level and rely on individual motivation. It's about challenging the business model through businesses and supporting businesses to do that and responding to the ever-changing consumer behaviours, um, hopefully strengthening our local business base um, so we can really get the benefits of local jobs, taxes, economic, social and environmental aspects instead of that local wealth being funnelled elsewhere. So uh, here's an example of the way our programme has supported one of our local businesses. So Ayrshire Blinds is based in Irvine in North Ayrshire. It's quite self-explanatory in terms of what they do. When approached by our community wealth building officer, David Jack, it was clear that they've always been a really community oriented uh, organisation. But what this programme was able to provide was a really uh, focused approach. Um, so after we've 
collected some of the baseline um, information, uh, David was able to then build an action plan and really tailor support. So in terms of land and assets, it was clear that Ayrshire Blinds had outgrown their premises. So David was able to support the business in tendering for a new North Ayrshire Council premises, and they moved to this new location in January of this year. In terms of procurement, Ayrshire Blinds was um, well ensured that the plumbing, the electrics and general fit out of their new um, location was done by local contractors and the community wealth building fund was able to support financially and contribute to the cost as well as training and consultancy fees. In terms of fair work, as well as being a living wage employer, Ayrshire Blinds give flexibility with working hours to staff based on family and personal needs. Um, they do struggle to recruit um, the expertise for blind fitting, believe it or not, and um, they are looking at maybe filling that skills gap through apprenticeship schemes. In terms of plural ownership, it's a family business, and although David's spoken to them about um, different models, um, I think they're quite happy um, but with, with this father and two daughters kind of sharing that, that business at the moment. Uh, but that's not to say that this ends here, and, and this is just the start of community wealth building engagement um, and just a nice example. Um, so I hope that gives a bit of an overview to um, what we're doing here in Ayrshire. Um, I would welcome any questions and yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Vary and Jude. really appreciate your input there in a, a really good way um, to round off our session today. Um, I am not seeing hands up in terms of questions, um, but I am seeing a couple of um, points that are being made in the chat box. Um, so uh, can I just um, if I go back, um, there's a question about, I know that Barbara, sorry, I missed that question just after Ruri, Ruri's contribution, and I'm not sure, is Ruri still in the room? Ruri, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm still yeah, here. Okay. There's a question in the chat box, just very quickly, quite like to bring this in, just about um, how much the third sector has responded so far. I don't know if you saw that one to the, um, uh, to the consortia bids that are available um, that you referred to. Um, so, so far no. there has been uh, a number of them and it's been more through the sort of health and social care procurement um, where we've had, uh, when in, in Glasgow we will normally break the, um, the it up into the three sectors, northeast, northwest and south, and there's been quite a number of occasions where groups have come together. So, for example, um, Quarriers and a number of other organisations in the northeast had come together to bid for for those uh, that package of um, work and and that has been quite successful there. There's also sort of a a huge body of work being done around the um, alliance to end homelessness, which has been uh, there's sort of 180 odd million over a five year period, and and that is led by a consortium. So it has been somewhat successful so far, but we're looking to expand that into other areas um, away from just the, the, the health care aspect of it. Um, and the plan is to look at contracts where maybe we specifically think they would be suited to either existing social enterprises or ones that that could be easily um, supported to capacity build to take it on and then look at how, uh, and it'll probably make some of the officers in the room wince, but legally how we can uh, ensure that it's only social enterprises uh, that are able to uh, to bid for that. Uh, and I think if we do it sort of under the guise of, you know, a pilot for community wealth building, it'll probably get around some of the, the legal impediments. Um, but that's kind of what we're, where we are with the, the consortium side of things and social enterprise contracting at the minute. Okay, and I suppose one of the things and um, challenges potentially going forward um, may be just how you include perhaps medium to small, smaller charities and, and voluntary organisations in this process, because it does tend to be the larger ones that have got the capacity, as you know, to be able to be included in that in itself, you know, is, is perhaps as it is not, not as equal as, as it might be, but um, I'm sure that's a conversation for another day. I am conscious of the time here. Um, uh, David, um, uh, you, David Somerville, um, who obviously um, came in earlier on, was asking about um, to what extent um, are you, and this is for everyone uh, across the local authorities, um, um, how much are you empowering local, local initiatives 
and via participatory budgeting um, in terms of, uh, if you know Arnstein's ladder, if you're familiar with that one, around empowerment <laughs> as opposed to consultation. And, you know, so does anybody have any kind of views they would like to share on that? Or David, do you want to come in and elaborate at all? Is David with us? Yes, yes, I am, sorry. Uh, I'm just so aware uh, of the frustration many uh, community organisations feel with stuff being done so far above their head. And uh, it is a matter of trusting locally led initiatives. Um, and so I was very heartened to hear of some funding being given to the business sector, for instance, um, in Drew's presentation, but in the same way, the aspirations uh, uh, for the last five years or more of 1% of, of non-pay spend being allocated through uh, or, or more or th through participatory budgeting processes. Um, in Edinburgh is very disappointing, just in Leith. Leith decides is the only part of, of, of the city where that's working. Um, it does take office of time and I totally understand, but it's just to encourage this to be part of the, the, the way that you, you engage. Um, and it's a complementary part to the um, structural getting together, banging heads together, um, collaboration um, by the, the key publicly funded bodies. Um, but if that could be married with um, uh, trusting, trusting uh, community led groups, community led local developments, I think that would be very helpful. OK, and I think we have Sinead and Ruri uh, wanting to come in on that. It's going to take you first, Sinead. Sure, of course. Um, I'm happy to share some um, thoughts from Fife on that. So prior to the 1% target between 2010 and 2021, Fife Council had allocated £1 million over 35 different grant schemes to a participatory budgeting type approach. In terms of the 1% target for Fife Council, I think that equated to something like £7 million, and we reported back that we diverted £11 million through a PB approach. And some of that's through capital projects, some of it was through um, grant scheme small projects, some of it was through um, engagement and commissioning of services. Uh, in terms of where we're going now, we are currently doing an options appraisal of digital tools and mechanisms to bring greater community voice into decision making and decision taking. Um, the other part to that was pre-pandemic, the council administration had identified a mainstream challenge for participatory budgeting to take a £22 million passenger transport budget and use a participatory budgeting approach to how we should invest that money in Fife. So that was our biggest example yet and a number of other budgets and opportunities have been identified and it very much remains a part of community wealth building that we further need to integrate into our approach. But I'm happy to share any um, background if that's of interest, David. I think I think that would be great, Sinead. Um, actually, if you could pass on the details and we can make sure that gets shared across the audience today, that would be tremendous. Um, Ruri, you were going to come in. Yeah, in, in Glasgow, we in our last budget there have devolved uh, one million pound each of the twenty three wards to um, to have a, a participatory budgeting process where they will decide on on what sort of physical aspects of the community are needing done. But we're we're very conscious as well that while devolving power is a laudable um, goal, you don't want to be seen to be just devolving responsibility or, or shirking the responsibility from councillors making difficult decisions to the community by saying that's the amount of money there is. So it's it's your problem now. So it's very much about as they build in the capacity within each of those communities because some will have, you know, great anchor organisations, great housing associations that will be able to facilitate um, uh, sort of citizens assemblies and groups to come together to make those decisions, whereas in other places there's a lot of work needs done on the ground to, to build that capacity. Um, I think one of the ways that we're trying to do it, which maybe isn't just as similar, is uh, we've got a community group who have, have led design of turning a, a kind of a rat run street into a, a city park. They've worked 
with uh, say uh, urban designers they've gone through the first three stages of sustrans bidding uh, and that has been kind of led from the very beginning by the community but it's been facilitated with some council money and while it's maybe not participatory budgeting it is devolving sort of power and influence to local organizations um, to, to have more of a say in kind of their own communities. That's that's great and good good to know. And I think a really welcome point as well. I'm sure you'll agree, David, about um, the issue of potentially passing responsibility down to communities as opposed to um, empowering them in the process. Um, OK, so uh, I'm just mindful of time now. I can see also that we're starting to lose people in the room, so I'm going to wind things up. We're just running a little bit on, but I think it's been worth it because that was a really good, I think, engaged discussion today as well as um, having some fantastic contributions from all of our speakers. So can I thank um, Tracy, Sinead, Alison, Ruri, uh, Vary and Jude for your for your for being here and for all your input today. It's been really really helpful. Um, can I also thank Elaine and Alison in the background for organising today's session once again? Um, and to all of you who've attended, I hope you found it useful. Um, as always, we're we're looking to bring together a final session um, where we bring all of the strands of this um, current programme that we've been doing with EDAS on community wealth building um, uh, together. Um, and that, that will be taking place um, in June. We're just finalising details for that at the moment, so look out for that. Um, and we will, as I'd said earlier, roll over um, the contribution. Sorry, I think I, I, I just saw in the chat box, I thought I had said Western House, I'd clearly had a middle midlife <laughs> brain <laughs> issue when I was starting off and I said Highlands and Islands. Clearly, I meant Western Isles, um, and we'll look to roll that into the next session that's taking place. Um, can I also just flag up for those of you who are here? We also have our EDAS conference, the next EDAS conference that's taking place in June online. Again, free to you all. Um, so it's focusing on place. So again, I think that would be something that you'd be interested in. Um, running on the 9th of June between 1 and 3 p.m. So again, just a bite-sized chunk from your afternoon if you're able to come along and join us for that registration is open now so thank you everybody really enjoyed today's session hope you did as well hope you found it informative please stay engaged and and we will be keeping you posted as to what happens next all right take care everyone thank you bye